Welcome to Don't Be Denied. In our previous podcast, part one, we talked about the administrative reasons why someone might receive a denial of benefits. In this podcast, we'll be discussing more of the medical reasons. I'm Dr. Alan Farron, and my co-host is Jordan Shields. By way of very short review, we talked a little bit about coding. It's very complicated. The fact that there are many seminars that are given for surgeons and their billing people. Those insurance people, those pesky insurance people you're talking about, those guys. It's very complicated and codes change very frequently over the years. And to keep up with the coding, it's not something that you as a person would need to do. However, it is important for you to have a general sense of what is happening, such as when you go and see your doctor, is this for a new visit? Is this for a short follow-up? Let's say you had an ear infection and you were treated for 10 days and a follow-up visit. And you need to look at those codes just to see on your bill whether or not you've been billed appropriately. Sometimes physicians will extend the coding so that they're reimbursed at a higher rate. It may not be them that's doing it. It could be their insurance billing person that's doing it. But you have that responsibility. I'm a big person for having an individual responsible for their care. Don't just pay the bill, look at it and make sure that you're billed properly. The same thing is if you've had a procedure, understand what the procedure was, how long you were in the hospital. If you were given crutches on the way out, were you billed for those? Sometimes you're given dressings, you will be billed for those, but you need to make sure that you're not charged for something that you didn't have. And remember that if you're about to go into a doctor's office, make sure it's the right doctor's office, because if you walk in the wrong one, you say, is this doctor so-and-so, you're going to get a bill for a short office visit. But that's just my own experience. And actually lately on your electronic medical records, when you send a note currently, they evaluate it to see whether it comports to basically being a visit. So... <laughs> They get you every way because it's fair, because physicians really don't have a lot of time. It's more convenient for them to respond to that format than getting on the phone for which they never get paid for. So with that introduction, there's a lot in medicine that's arbitrary and capricious. So Mr. Arbitrary and Capricious, can you fill us in? All right. Well, not all the denials are arbitrary. It could certainly seem that way. And one of the ways where carriers get you is on something called prior authorization. Prior authorization is obviously going to be something that's not for emergency visits. And it's usually not for something that's serious like cancer and heart attack and stroke and all that. Prior authorization has two parts. So we'll get to one part in a second when I ask Alan about step therapy. But the other part is when there's a certain elective or non-urgent procedure being done, typically a surgery, you need to get prior authorization, not only to make sure that it's covered, not only to make sure that the carrier recognizes that it's a benefit for which you should be covered, but also to get authorization on the type of therapy that might be necessary, the type of follow-up that might be necessary, and the length of stay called LOS, length of stay in the hospital. So for example, I've got knee replacement surgery coming up next week and my carrier has authorized me for one day. So I go in on a Thursday, surgery's on a Thursday, stay overnight, get just charged on a Friday, which is fine by me. But if there's a complication, then it's incumbent upon the hospital or the doctor's office or both, contact the carrier and say, Mr. Shields has had a problem. I have an infection. I had a stroke. I had a heart attack on the operating table, whatever it might be. And therefore we need to extend his stay. And that would be the end of our podcast. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'll do it from the hospital bit. But when you get a denial, say you didn't get prior authorization for this claim. It's like, well, the doctor ordered it and everything was fine and it's supposed to be covered. And I looked in the benefits book and said it's covered. Yes, but you didn't get prior authorization. The good news is that especially when you're dealing with a surgeon's office, they know this and they're going to say, hey, we're going to contact the carrier. Hey, but remember, as we emphasize again and again, all this is your responsibility. So you need to say, hey, doctor, do I need a prior authorization for this? Or, hey, my broker or, hey, my employer, 
do I need a prior authorization for this elective, usually it's elective procedure. That's where things seem a bit arbitrary. They're not, but they're not fully spelled out in your benefits booklet. So they can be confusing. And then there are those that require a second opinion. Alan, why don't you talk a little bit about second opinion and why they're necessary and how that works? Well, there's a very interesting study that the Mayo Clinic did a number of years ago when they looked at whether or not the second opinion supported the initial opinion. And they found that it did so only in 12% of the cases. So we're talking about not only surgical procedures, in particular things like spine surgery, things like hip replacement surgery, but also treatment plans, particularly the complicated plans for cancer therapy. There are a lot of different ways to treat an individual patient. So the second opinion becomes important to inform you that you are getting the right treatment plan, the right procedure, or the right sequence of care that's necessary. I always, when I was in practice, encouraged people to get a second opinion, particularly because of the type of surgery that I did. And when you're doing major head and neck cancer surgery, people are rightfully concerned about am I having the right procedure? Because it can be in some instances quite extensive. And some plans will require you, they'll have it in there, not only prior authorization, but mandatory second opinions. I don't see the mandatory in contracts as much as I used to, but yeah. when it first came out as a popular thing, you know, and all the carriers say, oh, we're going to save so much money. But, you know, it's never a bad idea. And I know Alan will say the same thing. When you've got an elective procedure, getting another opinion about what you need is kind of, you know, makes sense. I mean, I don't want to get surgery. Sometimes it's pretty clear cut. My upcoming knee surgery, I mean, I saw the x-rays and it's messy in there. It looks like a big bowl of old spaghetti. So clearly that knee has got to go. But sometimes there's physical therapy, there's drug rehabilitation and so on. And speaking of drugs, which is why I'm also known, besides Mr. Arbitrary and Caprice, the king of segues, what happens when we're looking at prior authorization for getting particular medication? What does that mean? How does that work? And what is the magic of step therapy, Alan? The magic of step therapy is that a health plan typically will want you to try a tried and true but less expensive drug as a primary drug. A good example of this is with diabetes. There are a number of new quite expensive diabetes drugs, but metformin has been the gold standard in treating diabetics. For like 25 years, long time. Yes, so it has got a proven track record. These other drugs may be a little better, but maybe not so. I recall personally, when I was first diagnosed with hypertension, my doctor wanted to start me on some new, rather expensive drug combination. And when I switched cardiologists, when moving to Northern California from Southern California, I found that I had kind of an old time cardiologist who said, you know, some of these drugs that have been around for 15, 20 years are just fine. And we'll use a combination of tried and true drugs and it'll be less expensive. They're generics and have been on those drugs for 25 plus years and they've been fine. And Kaiser is a master of really choosing the types of drugs that are effective. And they also consider whether or not a person will maintain taking that drug, the so-called recidivism. Are they gonna take it once a day? Drugs that are given twice a day or three times a day, typically people are not able to follow that. I know you wanted to be able to use the word recidivism at least once I know. in this podcast. And I believe that we've scheduled recidivism to be used in several subsequent podcasts. So stay tuned. Alan will continue to use the word recidivism and eventually explain to us what it all means. But leaving that aside, so Alan, I go to the doctor's office and they say, I need this and I need that. I go through the prior authorization. They approve a certain number of days to do this or that. They approve follow-up therapy. I'm going to get some medication. I'm taking the medication that's on the formulary list that the carrier has published. And yet at the end, I find that the claim is still denied because of some nonsense, speaking of arbitrary and capricious, called medical necessity. What the blankety blank 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 are they talking about? Well, it's different than blankety blank blank, I can assure you. What I'd like to do is give you a brief definition of medical necessity. Medicare has a pretty good overview of that. And it's really the things, the treatments, the tests 
that are necessary to diagnose, to treat, to prevent, to manage a particular condition that's within accepted norms. There are a number of organizations that have guidelines out that are reviewed by Medicare and by other health plans, and they accept those things as being acceptable for medical necessity. For a really good overview, we can refer you to our podcast called Demystifying. I can use that word, demystifying, Jordan? Demystifying, yes, yes. Okay, I just want to clear that with you. Because it doesn't suffer from recidivism. That's right. In any way, shape, or form. So demystifying medical necessity. And it'll tell you all you need to know and probably all you don't want to know about what medical necessity is and isn't. We're going to go back just a quick second and talk about something that's a little outside of medical necessity, but is everything about what the carrier is going to pay. We covered it in our first podcast on this subject. I'm going to briefly cover this right now. And that has to do with, okay, you've gone through, the doctor said this, and the doctor said that, and the carrier said this, but what if you went to the wrong doctor? What if you went out of network? Remember, with an HMO, it's a closed system. You must use providers in that system. If you go outside the system without permission and in a non-emergency basis, there's got to be an emergency. If you go outside that system, there's no coverage. Zero, nada. In an EPO, exclusive provider organization, with most of them, it's an expanded list of providers, and it could be national, but you must see those providers or there's no coverage. Every once in a great while, I'll see an EPO that has a little bit of coverage when you go outside the network, but generally speaking, no coverage at all when you go outside this network. With a PPO, much bigger network. When you see a PPO provider, you get paid at whatever level of coverage. When you see an unlisted provider, they're gonna do one of two things, possibly a third thing. One is they're going to pay those claims according to the negotiated rate they have with listed providers, which is a big reduction, and you're responsible for all of that reduction, or they're going to pay according to usual, customary, and reasonable fees, sometimes called UCR. What does that mean? They take a code. Let's say it's for an office visit. They take a code. They look at all the doctors in a geographic area, first three digits of the zip code, look at all the charges that they have, put them on a plot point, and they say, we're going to pay at the 90th percentile of that. That doesn't mean 90% of, it means the 90th percentile. So all the doctors can be charging a fee and then there's this narrow band that they charge too much and they cut back that to what's reasonable. When you get your benefit statement, it will say charges in excess of UCR, which you can then go back to the doctor and say, you're charging higher rates than everybody else in the area. Can we negotiate? Maybe go back to the carrier and say they're full of it. Or if they don't do UCR, then they say we're going to pay according to negotiated rates. So be aware that you must go by the rules of the system, depending on how the network is constructed. We said it in the first podcast. We're repeating it again because it comes up all the time and it never hurts to bring it up. But it does bring up a newer thing, a newer piece of legislation called the No Surprises Act, which relates to using listed and unlisted doctors. Alan, what can you tell us about that? But before I talk to, about that, you talked about negotiation, and I think it's important for people who go out of network, let's say to a diagnostic imaging center and have an MRI. And some of these places will charge in excess of $1,000, $1,500, And the negotiated rate that they have with a typical health plan is sub $1,000 typically anywhere from three to five hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. And it would behoove you if you do go out of network to a diagnostic imaging center and get one of these bills is to trot over their insurance person and have a discussion about requesting not only a reduction, but an equivalency of what their negotiated rates are for your particular health plan. Actually, to make a correction, you don't want to do that afterward. You want to do that beforehand if you can. You may not know it, though. You may not realize. It happens. That's possible. Yeah. But to always try and do it before. The other little trick in there is that if you pay cash, some of them will give you a discount instead of you using a credit card. You probably know this, but in case you don't, I mean, credit card companies do charge a fee to the payee. 
and that payee is suddenly stuck with, I was charging a hundred bucks, but now I only got $97 back. So if you agree to pay cash, they'll give you a discount. Sometimes the discount can be fairly substantial. So I've seen it happen. So there's all sorts of negotiating tricks, which we're going to cover in a future podcast called negotiating tricks or something like that. No, Alan, you tried to distract me. I did. Remember in your memory banks about the No Surprise Act. So here's a surprise. What is the No Surprises Act? So the No Surprises Act is very interesting. and Well, it's not that interesting, but go ahead and tell us anyway. Well, I think it is interesting. I think it comes from the Affordable Care Act, where they recognize that someone going to an emergency room, having a procedure, and having, let's say, the anesthesiologist not being in network. Which is, by the way, all the time. Yeah. And also, it can be a radiologist who is subsequently covering at night in the emergency room and not in your network. And so you could see a bill from an out-of-network physician in those instances. Under the No Surprises Act, they've eliminated that possibility so that if you go in and have emergency surgery and you have an anesthesiologist who is out of network, that anesthesiologist will be paid according to the negotiated rate that the health plan has with their anesthesiology personnel that are within that network. I think it's one of the better things that have come out of the Affordable Care Act. And what's kind of funny about it, depending on the state you're in, is even though the Affordable Care Act did a lot of really good things in terms of guaranteeing people access to coverage and all that, and I think it's great the ACA was passed, several things in the ACA were already being done as a matter of practice or as a matter of state law. And so in some sense, it, it did something that needed to be done. In other sense, it did something that didn't need to be done. When we've had claims with anesthesiologists and radiologists and other people that aren't part of the network, but are part of a medical team that's being brought in at the last minute, sometimes I think the only reason anesthesiologists wear masks is you can't really tell who was trying to stick you with the bill afterward because you never see them again. And they knocked you out in the first place. I mean, it's perfect robbery but they're not contracted. So at least in California with the carriers that we work with, we've never really had that problem, but we do have to go back to the carrier and say, they threw this anesthesiologist bill out. The anesthesiologist is part of the medical team. The doctor, the surgeon was on the list. So what's the problem? The carrier says, oh, okay, fine. And then they pay it. So this, this is like belt and suspenders. Now we have a federal law that makes the carriers do what most of them were doing already. But enough about doctor's choices and enough about no surprises because there are enough of those going around. Now let's talk about something really fascinating, Alan. I know you're going to love this. Let's talk about service choices. What do we mean when we talk about service choices and what's that going to mean to the patient who's suddenly looking at amount of bills and amount of rejection letters? Good question, Jordan. I'll prompt you by saying right level of service. How about the right level of service? That is much, much better. So right level of service means People who have a procedure done or have an illness have to be put in the right environment, the right medical environment for them to heal properly. Sometimes people will be put in a situation where they have recovered enough while in the hospital. They meet all the criteria. For example, they don't have a fever, their blood count, is trending or at normal, they are eating, they are ambulatory. Remaining in the hospital is not a choice. Health plans have something called a utilization management organization that helps them determine whether or not a person is in the right place for the right diagnosis and for the right level of care that's being given. So if someone, for example, Jordan, who's going to have his surgery next week, which he keeps on reminding us on every podcast to evoke sympathy. Right. Let's send those cards and letters. I'll give you my address at the end with a big sad face and a picture of my puppy. Yeah. And his doctor says, you know, Jordan, we're going to keep you a couple of days. You're a funny guy. We enjoy having you around. <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time. And so the utilization management nurses who are reviewing Jordan's chart say, and who don't think I'm that funny. Exactly, that he's not that funny. And in fact, he could really go home now. So Jordan, if he decides that he's not going to go home, he will be evicted from the hospital. Evicted. And get a bill for the additional length of stay. So it's a so-called length of stay criteria that utilization management organizations use. 
typically health plans have their own, but there are outsourced organizations like National Imaging Associates, who I happen to work for for five years, looking at the diagnostic imaging studies like CTs, MRIs, whether or not they were medically necessary or not. And then if someone had surgery and stayed longer than they needed to, or weren't moved to what's called a lower level of care. I don't like using the term lower. It's really the the proper level of care. So after Jordan surgery, if he's not doing so well and they're tired of him being hospitalized, they will move him to what's called a skilled nursing facility or a rehab center. Yeah, medical rehab center is usually the better term for it because skilled nursing always connotes elder care. So a medical rehabilitation facility is right. probably the right term for therapy, for assistance, but it does not require acute care like a hospital. Right. The intensity of care is not as high as what's needed at that juncture. And I'm usually not funny at any of those facilities either, but you'll typically see that for intense physical therapy. So you've got the hospital, you can get therapy there, but you're in an acute care setting where it's life or death things. You can go to outpatient physical therapy for your shoulder, your hip, or your knee, but sometimes you're older, maybe it was double knees and all that. So you might be in an intermediate care facility. They also call it that, you know, for a week while they do the rehabilitation. So you can get out of there and walk and then go to PT on your own. Small facilities, there's not usually hundreds of them in your in your backyard. I think we only have three hospitals in our county, but we've got one medical rehabilitation facility. So it's something that's done. But also make sure that that facility is in network. Yes. Because sometimes the hospital, their nursing staff will advise you, here's a list of three facilities that we can send you to. And you choose one and it's not in your network. But having said that, because we're dealing with average length of stay and pre-authorization and so on, if the doctor says that you need to be in an intermediate care facility that you can't go home, and there are only alternatives to keep you in the hospital, the carrier will be only too glad to authorize your movement to the far less expensive intermediate care facility. But you may have to get involved on the front end of that claim, so be prepared for that. So if you're going to have joint surgery, you may come up against these things. And in order to help you, that's why it's good to have a medical advocate or your insurance broker or your employer's insurance broker they can help you and they can help with the communications with the carrier. Now, that's what we're dealing with length of stay. That's what we're dealing with type of service. But what if you get the right type of service and all of a sudden the carrier's coming back and they're saying, yeah, we've got a bunch of codes here that this isn't covered. And you're looking at all these little codes on your benefit statement and you're looking at these codes in your billing statement, you're going, the hell am I looking at? What are all these things? I I went in for this and I came out for that. And the next thing I know, I'm being charged for 27 things. So this is called what, bundling or unbundling or what the hell is going on with this? It's, now? it's bundled procedures. Excuse my French, I get excited about this. I get very agitated. My face gets very red. So Exactly. Out. So bundling is not very complicated. If you have a situation where you have a group of physicians that are managing a particular disease or illness, a procedure, all those codes are bundled together into one single billing code. So it does save for the health plan in terms of that. However, there are programs now that are looking at bundling procedures. So if you have a, a surgical procedure and you've got the cardiac surgeon involved, you've got the cardiac anesthesiologist involved, you've got a person who is managing the blood portion, the nursing staff, a cardiologist who is managing the patient postoperatively, you've got the hospital, you've got the operating room, all those things are bundled together. And it's to reduce the insurer, the carrier's risk for having each of those individuals send a separate bill for each of the things that they did. So it's a risk bearing opportunity to manage care. Just out of curiosity, are you seeing this bundling as a common occurrence? Because I'm not running into it very often. Where are you seeing it in the United States? This is for value-based surgical procedures, and it's being done now. It's being piloted, and I'm not sure where, 
but for total joints actually, because there's a substantial variation in cost. There's also a substantial variation in outcomes, depending upon who the group is. And what's interesting about this is the United States is generally recognized being the most advanced in terms of medical technology, medical procedures, you know, surgery. I mean, whatever, we're always rated as, you know, number one or the most advanced. But when it comes to billing and all that, we tend to lag way behind because everyone's been able to run their own show. So as Alan was talking about, you got all these different providers that are involved in the billing thing and it gets very complicated. Alan and I have a business associate in Greece, who I just spoke to the other day, who's getting double hip replacement surgery next week. And we were talking about the insurance that she has and how it works and all that, but she's in Greece and she's going to be in Greece and has been in Greece for a long time. And she said, I don't really care about the insurance. I'm just going to pay cash. Well, of course, my heart gave a start to say, how are you going to pay cash for double hip surgery? Have you lost your mind? Then I realized, oh, wait, she's in Greece. And so she said two things. Well, three things. The first was, they bundle everything together. I have one number to pay, one rate, that's it, I'm done. Surgeon, assistant, surgeon, anesthesiology, hospital stay, physical therapy, bop, 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 bop. Then she said the second thing, which I cringed at, $17,000. And then she said the third thing, which is kind of interesting, because I said, so where was your physician trained? Oh, in the United Kingdom. He was in London for 10 years and all that. So, you know, getting top quality doctor, top quality care, regular hospital, antiseptic, the whole thing, 17 grand. And what would cost the United States uh, for the length of stay? She's talking about four days. They would give you one, maybe two, and it would still cost you 75,000 bucks. At least. As it happens, our insurance will be able to cover the 17,000. So she's going to get the whole thing done for free. That's great. So all good. So that's bundling. Now there's always the equal and opposite reaction using the Newtonian principles applying to insurance. What about unbundling and what a scam that is? What's going on with that? Unbundling is taking each of those things that are done and billing separately for them. A good example of this would be, let's say Jordan, instead of doing a hip, is going to have a hernia surgery. <laughs> well, what a great example. <laughs> I find myself cringing already about the whole thing. Yes, let's say I decide to do that. I don't want my hip replaced. I want hernia surgery. Okay, Alan, go ahead. It's important to have choices, Jordan. <laughs> So then the surgeon is going to charge for the incision, for the dissection, for the sutures, for each of the layers that he or she closes, and then for the dressing. And so that is an exaggeration, but that is something that is not that uncommon, where multiple codes are being used for a procedure that really only requires one or two different codes. Even more challenging I guess is a good word, is upcoding. And in my career, I sat on a lot of committees where we looked at physicians who were using upcoding. So an upcode would be if you had a medical visit, and let's say it's not a new patient visit, but a follow-up visit, but was billed as an extended visit, that's upcoding. I have a perfect example for it. Years ago, I had an ear infection. I went into the doctor's office, I saw a family nurse practitioner, and they lavaged the ear, took care of it. It was all fine. I was very happy to be there. It took 15 minutes. And then I got this bill. And the bill seemed a little high. And I happen to have the code book in my office because everyone should have one. When I first looked at it, and I know some of the codes off the top of my head, and I thought, this seems a little strange. So I looked at the code book, and it said I was charged for an extended visit with a doctor. So I called the billing service that had sent me the bill, and I said, there's a mistake here. The doctor's office put down extended office visit for a doctor. What I had was a intermediate office visit with a family nurse practitioner, which has got to be a different code and a lower charge. Right. They said, no, that's what the doctor said. So I called the doctor's office and the doctor's office said, yeah, that's what we said. Then they said this, which was their fatal mistake. The lady said, because you know, with the reduction that we have negotiated on the PPO network that we have, we don't get paid enough for what's going on. So we have to upcode. And as soon as she said it, I said, what is your name? And <laughs> I'm going to write this down. I said, I'm going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to send you a letter and I'm going to pay what I think is an appropriate fee. 
And if you refuse to accept it, then I'm going to report you the insurance company, the Better Business Bureau, and any other whatever I can think of, because upcoding is illegal. It is illegal. And it's intentional. Absolutely. And I won't say which doctors, because I have great respect for all doctors, but as business people, a little less respect. They go to seminars at conventions that teach them about bundling, unbundling, upcoding, CPT coding, and all this stuff, and they listen, and it's not good. So again, pay attention to your bill. Be very careful what you're seeing. Make sure you know exactly what you were getting and what you're being billed for, and come and join us on our next podcast where we're going to talk about something equally riveting. I have no idea what the subject is, but we've got a bunch of them so you can choose. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Jordan. It just makes good sense to have dedicated and experienced professionals at your side when you have a medical insurance claim denial or failed appeal effort. As experts, we are available to help guide you through your complicated, confusing, and often frustrating healthcare journey. Whether through a subscription to our educational series, blog posts, or the use of our custom personalized appeal assistance, we are your best choice to help resolve your insurance carrier denial issues. Connect with us for further information at medicalappealexperts.com.